Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with Lisa Robin Young from ARC Entertainment Media. We are going to talk about her journey as a musician and as an entrepreneur. She is a multi-passionate, just like I am. She's an author. She's a podcaster. You know, we do all the things, right? We can't, we can't stop ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it's just going to make it super fun to talk to her because we have a lot in common. We've done a lot of the same kinds of things and moved in a journey that took us kind of to the same kinds of, of things and, you know, be able ways to use the talents that we have. So let's get started. And just I'd love to kind of hear like how you got started in music, you know, what your journey looked like. Um, and then we'll maybe stop on points along the way of interest. Sure. So I, I've been a musician since I was a toddler. Uh, we had a big toy box that had a big wooden lid that came down. And that was my stage when I was two and I would sing and dance. And by the time I was three or four, I was wrangling up the neighbor kids and charging them a nickel to watch me sing and dance, right? Like I always had a side hustle. So music and business have kind of always been in my purview. Um, and so went to school. Um, I was about 10 and ready for the world. The band from Flint, which is my hometown, made it big. And that was it for me. I was like, I am going to be a rock star. Oh, that is oh, what Sheila, I am going right? to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and my parents were like, that's nice, sweetheart, but you really need to have a fallback plan. <laughs> uh, like, you know, every well-meaning parent does. And I was like, but that doesn't make any sense to me. If I want to pursue music, I should put all of my effort into that. So took all the music classes in high school, I actually had two six hours because the band teacher and the choir teacher both wanted me. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, y'all have to figure out how you're going to do my grade, but I'll sit wherever you tell me to sit. Uh, and so then went to college, uh, got my degree in music theory and music history and a uh, minor in vocal performance. And I recognized I needed to know the business side of things better. Mm -hmm. Right. I had heard the horror stories of Billy Joel getting taken by his manager and his agent and, and all of that stuff. And I was like, that will not be me. And so I took the business classes and the, the law classes and marketing and advertising and all of those things, um, partly to cover that, but also because I'm just, you know, I have a learning addiction, right? Like I want to learn all the things. I want to know all the things. I'm like that too. I'm curious. Why did you choose to major in uh, theory and history and not performance? because they didn't have a composition program mm. at uh, the campus of U of M that I went to. And they're like, well, we don't have composition, but we have a great theory history program. And I was like, um, all right, fine. Um, I actually started school at Bowling Green in Ohio and they did have a comp program. And uh, I was a freshman and they wouldn't let me into the comp program, but they would let me take intro to comp. So I took intro to music comp and I'm sitting in this classroom. There are like, I don't know, eight or nine of us. I am the only girl. I am the only freshman. They're all juniors and seniors. And I outscored them on everything. And I'm like, and you still won't let me in? This is ridiculous. And that's when I left. Mm. So I left school and I went back a few years later to a different school. And so that, that's the journey there. But I uh. wanted to write... Um, because, you know, I had a lot of self-image stuff that was like, I would love to be a rock star, but I think I have to write really good songs first, like mm -hmm. Billy Joel did, right? Like, that was my model growing up. So that's that's kind of how that trajectory went. Uh, then I left school and um, kind of set music aside because... I needed a job. I needed to work. I needed to make money. And I wasn't in LA. I wasn't in New York. I wasn't in any of the music meccas. I was in Ohio. <laughs> I was in Utah. I was in Michigan. Um, so had a family 
And then, um, gosh, it must have been about 2007 or eight. I was driving my car and I spun across three lanes of traffic on the freeway. And yeah, exactly. I was just clutching. The, I, at one point, I really did just let go of the wheel. And I'm like, well, whatever happens, happens. And I found myself. Um, That's a back. literal Jesus take the wheel moment. It was. It, was, it really was. As, as the car landed in the ditch, um, you know, back ended into the ditch, uh, the semi truck, boom, right. Pan, I, like the whole vehicle shook. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I should probably be dead right now. And the ironic thing was I was on the way to my therapy appointment with my therapist. So I get in the car and drive over and I'm like, so this just happened. And she's like, well, what do you think this means? And I'm like, well, if this is really my opportunity to start over, because I had been a financial advisor at this point, I had been heavily steeped in like uh, law and real estate and, and in all of the financial sector type stuff. I'm like, if this is really my opportunity to start fresh, because maybe I should have been dead by now, then I want to get back into doing music. I oh my really gosh. Wanna... First of all, I have to jump in because this is so analogous <laughs> to my story. Like I was doing, I mean, I was trying to do music on the side, but I was a director of finance. I, mm-hmm. I was an accountant yeah. and um, I had, uh, I had my first, two, my two kids, well, my first daughter and I developed an autoimmune disease and I got really sick and I ended up in the hospital and it was around, it was 2005. So it was kind of really similar to your timeline. Right and I had that same time, thing. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm like losing weight. I cannot keep anything down. Like if I get out of here, I'm going to do music and it's that moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is where it gets a little woo woo because <laughs> if it wasn't already woo woo enough, this is where it gets really woo woo. I got in the car and as I started the car to head back home, I, I heard this very clear voice. And I like to tell people that God talks to me in the voice of James Earl Jones, right? <laughs> so I hear this booming voice, you're going to record 300 songs. I'm like, I'm a stu- oh, who the hell what now? I'm going to do what? Come again? I'm going to record 300 songs. And I'm like, well, that seems like a lot to me, but okay. And so we started down this journey of just, you know, setting up a studio in the house and just recording, not necessarily to put it out to the world, but to build this body of work and learn how to use all this equipment because I had never done it before. And we're about halfway through that project now. I think we've got 130 ish songs that we've, that we put together and, uh, what you had written all these songs before. Oh, no, 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 no. Many of them are covers. Some of them are Okay, got it. um, And a lot of them are covers where we've taken the song out of its genre. In fact, that's where... I um, love those kind of covers. Those are my favorite. Yeah, and this is that's where my last album really was born. Um, Mm. It was this whole, uh, let's take these songs that people think they know (laughs) and let's give them a new setting so that people can experience them differently. And so uh, the song that gets played a lot is our like smoky bluesy version of Aerosmith's dream on. And we've done it in, in performance and people will pull me aside afterwards and go, I finally know what the lyrics are to that song. I never knew those lyrics. I didn't know what they were. And it's like, yeah, it's really eye opening to see this song. That's really very timeless that was written by a 17 year old Steven Tyler. And mm-hmm. he sings it now in his sixties. And it's just so, it's still so relevant um, and we just do it without the screaming guitars. So, you know, right. So you can you hear know, the lyrics. <laughs> right. So that people can take it in and, and, and let it have a deeper meaning for them. People who would never listen to Aerosmith or people who only ever hear the guitar and, and, and turn it down or people who only ever listen to Tony Bennett and, you know, like, like let's bring some of that together. Like let's give people an opportunity to experience the stories of music mm-hmm. in different ways and let that change their lives. Like that's really that. what I live for with, with my music and my performance in general. So that's really cool. I love that. Um, on women of substance, which is my, it was an online radio platform. Now it's a podcast, but I, when it was online radio, I had a show called we've got it covered. And I love when people would submit covers like that, where it was, just completely taken out of its genre. You know, it, it, some you know heavy metal song now becomes a jazz standard style. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, but you know what? It just shows off the timelessness of the melody and the lyrics that someone wrote that, like you said, someone who doesn't listen to that genre will never hear that song because they right. just, they, they, they can't, they can't hear it. They like have to turn it off because it's like, this is not my thing. 
Right, exactly. And and for me, music has always been about storytelling. And I think that's part of why, you know, I resonate so deeply with with songwriters and, and musicians like Billy Joel. It's like we as as minstrels, you know, our muse is the world around us. Our muse is the life that we're living, the lives of our friends and colleagues, the stories that they have to tell, the the rich tapestry of the connections that we've made in the life that we're living and to be able to, to bring some of those threads out and craft, you know, a, a little micro tapestry for people to really just appreciate the colors mm-hmm. and the nuances and the, the, the storylines of people who might otherwise you might never ever hear about or know about, but that story is a timeless story. You know, it's that, that timeless arc of the hero's journey and we need that. It fills us up. Yeah. There's a time and a place for here's my number and give me a call and let's go meet somewhere. And like those songs are fun. And, and I like those songs too. And those aren't the songs that last, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, there was a time and there's a guy on YouTube who did this mashup of these six country songs that all sound like identical. They have the <laughs> same formula and he plays all six of them together at the same time. And you're like, yeah, it just sounds a little busy in the middle, but it sounds like it's all one song. And it was like this formula that worked in country music for like five or six years. And they were all top 10 hits. And I was just mm-hmm. like, but they're all forgettable none of them are Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Mm-hmm. Like none of them have the substance and the, the longevity and the memorability of that kind of a, of a classic tune. And it was a very daring risk-taking kind of song when it was put together. It was actually three songs that, that Freddie Mercury like smushed into one. And we need that kind of creativity. We need that kind of ingenuity. We need that kind of inspiration as human beings just trying to get through our day, right? Like yeah. the, the idea of a world without music, a world without good stories told through music, like that's not a world I want to live in. Yeah, and I think there's different kinds. Like you said, those kind of country songs or Call Me Maybe or whatever, like that's what you put on in the radio when you're in the car and you don't, you're not wanting to focus on it. It just sounds good and you're just going about your day. But if you really want to like experience the song, you know, that's when you have a song like a, like a Billy Joel or an Elton John or, you know, Bohemian yeah. Rhapsody or whatever, when you're just like, you know, it's almost like you're going to a live show. Like you're going to sit there and you're going to really listen to it. And yeah, those yeah. are the kinds of things I listen to, like on my walks and stuff, because I don't have other distractions. Like I can really dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and even, even the music that, that is music just for the sake of fun and entertainment, like that's still allowing us to feel something. Totally. Right? It's still allowing us to have an experience. I mean, Saturday night's all right for fighting. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to go out and fight, but I love that song and I'm going to like bop around to it. And I feel energized and alive. And that's the, that's the purpose of the song, yeah. right? It's not to inspire you to go out and bash heads in. It's like to get you alive and feeling things in your body. And that's what good music does. And that's what great storytelling can do. So, yeah. So once you um, kind of had this epiphany that you're going to start, you know, recording, are you also out there performing? Are you building up a fan base? Like, wh- wh- where did you go from there? Yeah. So um, I started just recording on my own, just kind of for myself, and then started sharing some of the videos of the rehearsals and the performances that I was doing. Um, that led to my second album um, and consequently my third album. And, uh, so that work is out there. We're working on album number four right now. Uh, I, you know, I tell people it's, it's pop infused jazz and blues, right? So we do Mm -hmm. jazz, we do blues and we pull these songs out of their genres and, and, and bring them in, um, in the process of, of working on the music that I've been working on, I was also invited to be a guest, um, featured artist. I don't know how you, how you call it. I was, I was put on Disney plus in a reality show, (laughs) Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, I'm still out there performing. I'm still doing a little bit of touring. That's been real challenging the last few years. Um, obviously pandemic and whatnot. Um, so what's but, that reality show? Is it on yet or? Oh uh, yeah, no, it's still on. It's called Encore and it's the show where they take, uh, adults, 
uh, and reunite these casts of High School Musicals to remount their High School Musical. And you've got like less than a week to put the show back on. Wow. And some of us didn't even have the same roles that we had when we were in high school. So oh, like, no. like learning new lines and you know learning new choreography and, and all of that stuff. Um, so I was one of the kids from my high school uh, that got to go back 26 years after we mounted that production and, and do that show again. Um, and so it's out there. It's episode That's three fun. of Encore on Disney Plus. Uh, and it's fun. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity. And in that instance, what I really liked about that, that opportunity was, yes, we were doing this production of The Sound of Music. And, you know, almost everybody knows The Sound of Music. And there's a storyline there. But because it was a reality-based show, we also got our storylines. Mm. And for me as a performer, that's really the thing. Like for me, it's never been about, look at me, look at me. I want to be a, I mean, yes, I want to be a rock star, but I want to be a rock star because I recognized the influence and the impact that you can make in people's lives immediately. Right? Like when the song is over and people come up to you and they're like, Oh my gosh, I never knew those words. And now they mean so much to me. Like, for me, that is the, that is the pinnacle moment. And you're like, that is the mountaintop experience for me. It's like, I made, I made a change in someone's life. You know, you're on stage and you're performing in a, in a theatrical production and you've got to have a New York accent and somebody from New York is sitting in the audience and comes, comes to you afterwards. And you're just speaking in your regular American, you know, Midwestern uh, dialect. And they're like, you're not, you're not really from New York. I'm like, Nope. (laughs) No, I've only visited like three times, right? So like to to be able to reach into people and stir up stuff that maybe hasn't been stirred or needs to be stirred or needs to be stirred again um, to inspire them, to, to incite them to make their lives better. That's always been my driving force. Like from the time I was three wrangling the neighbor kids, I'm like, this is going to change your lives. Give me a nickel and I'll show you more, right? Like that's, that's always what it's been for me. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like the time I was singing at a coffee shop and I was I was singing a song about my grandmother who has Alzheimer's and a guy came up to me afterward. He's like, my dad was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it just this just made me feel less alone and less scared and handed yeah. me a $20 bill, you know? And I was just like, oh, it's yep. so awesome. You know, I just love that about being a performer and a recording artist and all of that. And, you know, this kind of plays into, you know, one of the things you like to talk about was is being a celebrity in your own niche. Like some of us, you know, I was in my 20s, like I wanted to be famous, right? Oh, yeah. And then by the time I was 30, I was like, no, not really. I don't want to be famous. I just want to do music. Uh, and now I'm just like, I just want the people that are going to really be affected and love what I do to see what I'm doing. Like, that's all I want. Right. And so, you know, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that idea of, you know, celebrity versus celebrity within your niche. Right. So um, if you haven't already watched it, I highly recommend looking at Jennifer Lopez's documentary Halftime. Oh, I not started watching that on the airplane. I don't think I think I think I didn't quite get to the end. The other yeah. Day. So um, you don't need to watch very much of it to get the sense of how much responsibility a celebrity carries on their shoulders. And yeah. I've worked with, you know, uh, people who are just starting from scratch and, you know, nine figure music superstars with signed NDAs. Right. And and when you look at people at that level, they are building an economy based on who they are. Right. They've got employees, they've got staff, they've got teams, they've got dancers, they've got musicians, they've got entourages, they've got all these people that they've got to pay a paycheck to. And so it's even more important for them to stay in their zone. Mm -hmm. Like one artist that I worked with, we had to sign a contract that said we would only address them in a certain way. We, you know, we wouldn't mention any of the work that they do. We, I mean, like there was, there were all of these conditions around and I was like, well, this seems kind of ridiculous. And then I recognized that even just making mention of those things could be a trigger that takes them out of the zone. Mm. And if they're out of the zone, they're not performing at their best. And if they're not performing at their best, that's going to impact the lives of all the people around them, all the people that are relying on them for a paycheck, for a roof over their heads, for food in their mouths. And I was just like, woo, I don't know that I want to have that much responsibility. And like you, I was like, you know, I want to perform. And I want to do this on my own terms. And yeah, I want to have some staff and and a team to help me, but I don't want that much pressure. And then to be in the public eye 
all the time the critical public eye of, you know, what is she wearing and did she gain 10 more pounds and, and all of the stuff that goes with being a celebrity. When you are a celebrity at that level, you are a target for a lot of stuff that you didn't ask for. And some people like JLo are wired for it. You know, at one point in the, in the, the documentary, uh, they're interviewing Ben Affleck and, and he said, well, I said to her one day, you know, like, doesn't it bother you? And she said, I expected it, right? Like she knew if she was going to rise that high, she had to have really tough armor so that she could withstand the slings and arrows. She of did, person. but she still was affected by it. I mean, oh, no absolutely. one wouldn't be affected by the kinds of, you know, just, uh, the stuff that she was getting around all of her relationships. Oh, and I think absolutely. Say that, but yeah, she has a much thicker skin than most of us. Right. And, and, and and part of that comes from this idea of separating ourselves from the work, mm. right? Like um, at one point she says, you know, I, I came to the realization that I wasn't doing this for the award. I was doing it for the impact. I was doing it for, no, don't get me wrong. The money is important too, but like it was really about how could I touch and change and reach people. Right. And, and the awards are just kind of that nice, extra to have kind of a thing. And so when I looked at my own work and what I was trying to do, I'm like, yeah, I want some recognition because I've worked really hard and I know my stuff and I'm good at what I do. And at the same time, you know, I don't need a massive entourage and a tour bus and, you know, stages that rotate and all these fireworks and like, I don't need all that. I can be the celebrity in my space and be known by the people who matter to my economy, right? To the, to the income and the livelihood and the lifestyle that I want for myself and the people that are supporting me. I don't need to be the next JLo or the next Beyonce. I can be the best me and still make really good money doing what I love and serving the people who matter most to me and developing an audience that really gloms onto that and gets that and appreciates that. I had read a book, gosh, maybe in my twenties. Uh, and I, the name of the, the name of the author escapes me. Her first name is Jada, but I can't remember anything else. It was Jana something. And she had this, it was a book for musicians about how to have, you know, a six figure career as a musician. And basically what she had said was you find six towns in your regional area where you can go do a show twice a year, sell your merch, <laughs> And this was all before the internet, right? Like this uh -huh. was all before the World Wide Web. So, I mean, you know, you don't need a world tour to be successful and be a celebrity in your space. It's about being true to what really matters to you. You know, owning the dream that is your dream and not somebody else's dream. And, and standing your ground on that while you're building this body of work that's going to outlast you, right? And recognizing that as you're building this body of work, this is also, you know, intellectual property. It's an asset. It's a, it's a financial <clears throat> resource. And as you're building that, future generations get to, you know, derive some benefit from that as well. If you're setting things up properly, if you're treating this like a business and not an expensive hobby, um, you have the potential to be as big or as small as you want to be and still make plenty of money. And that yeah. to me is, is what becoming the celebrity in your niche is. It's like, you don't have to chase after gigs or clients or leads anymore. Everything is much more effortless because they know who you are. They're like, oh my gosh, yes, Brie. I love her work. Oh my gosh, yes, Brie. Let's have her. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about Brie. Let's do that because Brie's amazing, right? And people start calling your name and calling you instead of you having to go, please, will you book me for this next gig? Please, can you find a spot in your show for me? Please, please, please. People are like, oh, I know you. You're awesome. Of course we want you. That's what becoming a celebrity in your space looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and finding that space. I mean, for me, like the spaces were so specific. It's like, you know, uh, my local, local uh, churches, right? Mm -hmm. I started to become known or uh, mothers of preschoolers groups in California. Like, you know, people started to know me or whatever, yeah. or women's groups in California, just because they talked to each other and I was doing the circuit, you know? So yeah, like you, you don't need a big, you don't need to like reach out further. And, and the internet has made it so much easier too, because you can still do the local thing, but you then can also build 
a tribe of people online that are absolutely. your people, even if you're not able to go out to their location. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't tell you the number of virtual concerts that I've done myself or, or participated in or, or, you know, just sat and watched and enjoyed because I was like, I don't even want to put clothes on today and go out. Totally. Else. <laughs> I just want to sit here and enjoy something and, and let me do that. Right. I've done, you know, house concerts where we've got the cameras set up and we're streaming it out to a, a paid ticket audience. Right. And I get more money from the paid tickets from people in Europe that are watching me live than the people in the room, right? It's about figuring out for yourself what really works for how you're uniquely wired to work, right? You and I are what I would call fusion creatives, good at a lot of things, don't ask us to pick just one. And probably if you're like me, struggle with asking for help or receiving help and we're getting better at that. We're like, we're learning, we're getting better. But there are also two other primary kinds of creatives, the chaotic creative who is very go with the flow, trust your instincts. The experience is the most important thing. Like, what is it going to look and feel like for my people? That's the Lady Gaga's of the world, right? Like, that's where that's where they shine. That's their focus. It's, it's got to be a great experience. It's got to wow my people. But on the other end of the spectrum are the linear types. And these linear types are very much... Uh, what's the budget? What's the schedule? The systems and the processes. Order is the rule of the day for these folks, right? And because they're so number focused, they often find financial success a little faster than everybody else. But that doesn't mean it's not possible for everybody else. It just means you have to find it in the way that works for you. I got to yeah. ask, so how many creatives do you think are in that third, that linear? Because I feel like there aren't a lot. Well, see, now linears don't tend to self-identify as creatives, but when you think about interior designers, instructional designers, anybody who's developed intellectual property, mm. systems, methodologies, um, one of my one of my favorite uh, linear cusp types is Mike Michalowicz. He's written Profit First. Oh, I love and, Mike Michalowicz. Yeah, yeah. And so he's a linear cusp type. So that's why he writes books about systems and methods and processes and all of that. But he's also got... A little bit of fusion in him. He's right. If you, read, your pies, if you so. read Get Different, you know, he's just yeah. talking all about like the crazy ideas that he tries for marketing, you know? Yeah, exactly. 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 And so, you know, they're out there. They just don't tend to identify as creatives. But here's what I tell people. All entrepreneurs are creatives. Not all creatives are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. If you are a creative, someone who is using your creations, your ideas, your innovations as your livelihood, then yes, you are a creative entrepreneur and it behooves you to be looking at your business with the eyes and the lens of a business owner, not just, well, these songs are my babies. Well, they might be, but some of them are going to be more profitable for you than others. And you need to make some very serious decisions as a business owner about what song am I going to lead with when I start this show? What show am I, what song am I going to end with when I close this show? What's going to create the best story for my audience in this setting, in these conditions? And pick the songs that are really going to help your audience come along with you for the ride. You can't just be like, well, I like that song, so I'm going right. to play that one all the time. Like, maybe your audience hates it and you shouldn't keep playing it. You know, it's just a thing. you got to recognize that. Yeah, no, or maybe the song doesn't come across as well live as it does on a recording or, right. you know, it's exactly. really long or what, you know, and, and you love it. And, you know, it's, it's so personal to you. But yeah, really, really good point. So let me ask you this, because I do always ask this, because we are the Profitable Musician Show and all that stuff, right? Like we talk about income streams. Um, how would you say your income streams break down and like not even just as a musician right because you're a multi-passionate as you called it fusion creative right so yeah. you're doing a lot of different things which i think there are many musicians out there that are doing that or could do that um so i, I think it's super interesting to to kind of learn like where, how does your pie break down as far as your, your income streams? Yeah. So I don't have a lot of performance income right now from the music side of things, just because the pandemic has been, you know, kind of where that's at. And we've <laughs> been doing a lot of moving and traveling. Um, we've moved twice now in the last 12 months. So wow. it's, yeah, it's been a bit of an adventure, like just trying to get the office set back up and all of that. So um, the bulk of my income right now, probably about 80% of it comes from the business side of things that I'm doing, like work coaching with clients and, and working with, um, you know, other creative entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. Um, and part of that is because we have a pay for results model. So if they make money, we make money. 
And if they don't make money, we don't make money, but we keep helping them, right? Like until mm. they do make money, like that's how, that's how we set this up. Um, and then uh, I would say probably about 15%, not quite 20% uh, of the revenue is coming from uh, merch, like books, CDs, online classes, Got um, it. things like that. How like, would you like, say this was before the pandemic? Like, have you shifted more into the coaching side? Yeah, actually, um, the 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 pandemic, the first year of the pandemic was actually great for me. <laughs> like 2020 uh, into 2021 was actually a really good year for me um, financially because people were pivoting and people were looking for new ways of thinking. And so, yes, yeah, a lot of us more, I experienced that too. A lot of us experienced that as, yeah. as people who help musicians to kind of pivot and, and explore new income streams. Right. And, and people who were leery about doing anything online, you know, started to make a mass migration to this is the only way we can do this. So let's figure it out. And, yep. you know, us being at the front edge of that, we're like, okay, come along. Let us, let us show you how that works. Um, but what I'm finding now is I'm stepping more into performance opportunities and um, recording opportunities because these virtual walls have come down and people are like, well, you can just record that track digitally and send it to me. And I'm like, yes, I can. As a matter of fact, let me do that for you. So we don't have to be in Nashville or in L.A. or in New York or, you know, wherever the hot spot for your kind of music is anymore. We just need to be building those relationships as we go so that when someone needs a drummer, they can call you and you can sit and do that track for them and send it to them, et cetera. Right. Um, so I'm seeing more of those opportunities coming back. Um, and, and for me, still almost all of them are digital, not, uh, and that's just cause we just landed in Bloomington like less than a month ago. So I'm still learning who's who and what's what in my local yeah. area. No, I totally get it. I so, moved yeah. back down here right before the pandemic. So, you know, even if I did want to, you know, relaunch my performing career, like it just wasn't going to happen because I just moved back. Right. Um, and, and now I'm, you know, I'm now I actually took a church job. So I'm getting that every week, you know, and yeah. then that's opening up opportunities. You know, once people see you out there, then they're like, oh, do you do weddings? Do you, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And can so I, that's, you know, you just got to get out just there speak to that for a second, because yeah. I, I really want to encourage musicians who aren't yet at that profitable, sustainable place with their music to go do whatever it is that they need to do to have some sustainability and relief in their lives. If that's a day job, a bridge job, drive and ride share, like do what you have to do and and let the stig stigma, quote unquote, stigma of that drop the judgment around it. Because here's the thing. Every single creative that I know starts waiting tables, driving buses, cleaning floors, doing whatever they need to do. And then they rise. You know, J-Lo did not start as J-Lo. It was a long career that got her to where she is now. And she started, she literally started by leaving, running away from home, basically at 18 years old, right? And like living on, you know, people's couches and doing whatever right. she and could. Going to, to tons of gig. auditions all the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so you've got to do what creates a space of safety for you so that you can take those risks musically, so that you can show up more authentically and doing the work that really matters to you as a musician, as an artist, right? If you're constantly wondering about, well, geez, where am I going to sleep tonight? And how am I going to put food on the table? Like that saps your creativity. And there's been a lot of judgment around, oh, you're a musician who also works a day job. Mm. Like we've got to let that go. We've got to take that away because we all have to just do what we can to get from survival, from subsistence into this place where we're thriving. And I'm going to tell you, when you have that piece handled, profitability and sustainability in your business becomes so much easier. Right? Oh, I As so agree with this. I yeah. so resonate with this. And I've been thinking a ton about it lately because you're right. There is a stigma. It's like, you got to have no plan B. You just got to get out there and do it. And because if you have a plan B, then, you know, or if you've got this other thing, then you'll just not do it. Right. Yeah. And that's not true. That's yeah. not true. And if you get out there and you don't have anything else sustaining you, like you said, it's going to kill your creativity because you're going to be stressed, but it's also going to cause you to show up as desperate and, and just right. like, I need this gig. I need, you know, I'm not right. going to be able to pay my electric bill if I don't get this gig and right. showing up desperate 
is not going to get you the gig. No, like no. I've, I've done enough it. hiring that to know that you can tell when the person it's like palpable when the person really yeah. needs the job and that makes oh, yeah. them undesirable. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and this is true for, you know, entrepreneurs, musicians it, across the board. And I tell people, you know, you shift your mindset, let your job be your sugar daddy or let your job be your side hustle, right? Music is my thing. And my job is my day job is my side hustle, right? Or your, it, of, it's your, it's your music, your number one music investor. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is my, this is my biggest patron. My biggest sponsor yep. is the job that I wear. I am my biggest sponsor, right? I, I, I think, I think the more we change that paradigm, the more, uh, we're going to be able to create lives for ourselves as musicians, as artists, as creatives that are fulfilling so that we can feel like we're successful now. And, and I have this thing that I tell my clients, success is a destination and you're already there, right? Mm. So take a look around you. Look, look at the room that you're in. Look at the space that you're in. Look at the clothes that you're wearing. Look at the car that you're driving. If you, this is success right now today. And if you don't like the success that you see, you have to make some decisions about what you're going to be, do, have, or experience differently so that success looks different tomorrow, period. End of discussion. Now, what you choose to do, that's up to you. I can't say. But once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And if you're not happy with the success you have, then you got to do something different. Something, something else has got to happen for you. Otherwise, you're going to keep staying stuck in the same paradigms. And if that means getting a job, get a job. If that means, you know, asking a friend to support you financially or starting a Kickstarter or you know, whatever it takes, right? Like don't have shame in the fact that we all need to live. We all need to survive. We all need to pay the bills, whatever it takes. I love that. Yes. I've been thinking so much about this lately. So I'm glad that you brought that up sure. and you guys don't feel, don't feel shame in doing this. It's, I love the idea of thinking that like my boss is my biggest patron or whatever, you know, like I'm working for him because he's providing me or her providing me the money to fund this thing. Yep. Right. Or you're, you have your own, you know, you're a freelancer or whatever. So like you said, you're your own biggest investor, mm -hmm. but it's just going to make you feel so much more comfortable in the space of being an artist because you're not stressed and desperate and all of that. So I love this conversation. I'm glad we, we got there. So is there anything else that you want? We've covered the creators spectrum. I love that hearing the three kinds of creators. We talked about being a celebrity in your niche. Is there anything else that you want to make sure to talk about while we're here and, and we've got listeners? Yeah. So for me, the number one thing, if you, if you remember nothing else from today's episode, I think the one thing that I always want to drive home is my favorite quote from Judy Garland. Always be a first rate version of yourself instead of a second rate version of somebody else, mm. right? Especially as a, as a musical artist, especially if you're doing cover songs, it's really easy to borrow and take and use what's already been done. And, oh, but I'm going to put, you know, my little, my little, my little flavor on that. And it sounds so much like it's already been done. It's like not innovative, right? It's not new. There's, there's no life force in that. I'm inviting you to really stand in what you love and what's true for you and, and what you want to bring into the world because there's nobody else on the planet that's you, that has your life experiences, that has your worldview, that's, that's been through what you've been through. And all of that stuff can shape your music, your work, the way you interact with other people. And we need that. The world needs who you are. And, you know, I want you to be yourself, warts, sparkles and all, you know, we talk mm -hmm. about warts and all, but we have sparkles too, right? Like let's, let's accept all of who we are and bring that to the work that we're doing, bring that to the music that you're creating, because that's what your audience wants. Your right audience wants to be your fan because of who you are and the messages that you're bringing and the way that you're showing up. You know, Lady Gaga has her little monsters who are rabid, adoring fans of hers. And some of those people might like Katy Perry, but some of them may not. Some of them might like Shania Twain and some of them may not. And some of them might like you and some of them may not. But your little corner of the world has a collective of people who are clamoring for exactly who you are and what you have to offer. But you got to take down those masks and share them. Don't try to be somebody else. Bring yourself fully and completely to every performance, every rehearsal, 
every song that you write all the time. That's not always easy, but it's really important and the rewards are worth it. Love it. Love it. That's a great uh, one minute inspirational speech there that you just gave. And I think that's really important. So I know you also have books and you have a podcast. So can you let them know where, what those are and where you, where they can find them? Well, you can find my books on Amazon or where any bookseller is sold. Uh, the Secret Watch is a parable about defining and achieving success on your own terms. Creative Freedom, uh, How to Own Your Dreams Without Selling Your Soul is my first how-to guide for building a profitable, sustainable business as a creative entrepreneur. It goes more into the creative types and how to craft something that works for you. Uh, you can go to my website, lisarobinyoung.com. Robin's got two Bs, not one. So you get to the right place. Uh, take the quiz. Find out what your creative type is. You don't even need to opt in. It's just there freely available for you. And I'm on all the socials as Lisa Robin Young. You can Google me. I'm around. You'll find me. I would love to connect and learn more about the creative work that you're doing. So let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been really great. Super inspiring and also really uh, you know, educational and strategic. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.